Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Harris. And today on our show, we have a former resident of the CNMI, but no stranger to us, Mr. Angelo Villagomez, an officer with the Pew Charitable Trust and an advocate for the formation of the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument. He's back in the CNMI to uh, give us an update and to introduce us to uh, a couple of gentlemen who have actually been to the trench. Angelo, welcome home. Hey, good morning, Catherine. It's great to be here. Um, I just do want to note, um, you know, uh, sort of like being a U.S. Marine, once a resident, always a resident. <laughs> That's um, true. I, my, while my body may be in other places, my heart will always be here. I think we know that. It's pretty evident by the Sanahi you're wearing uh, today. Do you wear that when you're off island? Um, I try to. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of heavy, so uh, not all the time. And when I'm in Washington, D.C., I have to wear a tie. Ah. Uh, usually when I'm in the islands, I'll wear this. And it gets a lot of questions, and uh, it's actually something that's unique to the Mariana Islands. There's no other place in the world that has uh, uh, jewelry quite like this. And it, it, people are very interested to learn what it is. And I always tell them where it's from and where I'm from and what it means. Well, it's definitely one of the things that make us unique in the Marianas, as well as the Marine Monument. Um, it's been kind of quiet for the general public. Give us an update about what's going on, or if you'd yeah, like. Sure. So you know, going back, um, you know, so the protection of the Marianas Trench is it, it's a, a journey that's been going on for about ten years. Um, the community actually started learning about this in 2007, um, and. Uh, I was one of the main advocates for its creation, um, and, and if you look back, uh, we, were, we were advocating for a very large, highly protected marine protected area that would have been managed by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. When it was created, um, we didn't actually get everything that we wanted. Um, it was a lot smaller than we thought it was going to be. The, some of the protections weren't as strong as they could have been, and the uh, federal offices that were put in charge of the management were, were different offices. It was uh, NOAA Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they have a very different mission from the sanctuaries uh, program. And, you know, as a result, um, the monument that we sort of had envisioned isn't the monument that we sort of got. Um, and, you know, the, the, the focus has been different. Um, in what way has the focus been different? Sure. So if you, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they're the, the agency that manages the National Wildlife Refuges. Um, and here in the Marianas, the closest one is the Retidian Point National Wildlife Refuge over on Guam. And your typical National Wildlife Refuge is going to be uh, a fence and a sign that says, Welcome to the National Wildlife Refuge. And the mission is slightly different. It's more about um, just protecting that resource. It's about keeping out the poachers. So your typical employee is going to be uh, a person with a badge and a gun, <laughs> uh, like a, an enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. um, and Fish and Wildlife has those. We have those here. We have them on Guam. Whereas the, the mission of the sanctuary is a slightly different. It's more of outreach and education and research and interpretation. Um, and that's sort of what we envisioned. Uh, the sanctuary's program is in the Department of Cong Commerce. The uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is in the Department of Interior. So they're, they're different agencies within different government agency, uh, different government departments. Um, and so some of the, the, the pace has been a result of who is the manager. At this time, what is actually um, allowable as far as activities in the monument and what is not allowed? So that I, I can't even answer that question because they haven't even published a draft management plan. Okay. So, so there's the, so nothing has changed from, from in the last 10 years. There, there is a declaration out there. Um, Immediately after the declaration, they ended commercial fishing inside the uh, islands unit, which is the, the waters around Asuncion, Mog, and Yurakas. But you're still allowed, you know, any, there's no commercial fishing that goes on here of the scale of an industrial. There's no industrial commercial fishing that goes on here. Um, so no fishing boats based on Saipan were affected by the declaration. Um, you can still, I went up there a couple of years ago. You can still go up there. Um, you can still fish. Um, you know, but it's far away and it's dangerous and you can only go during certain times of the month. So really, for the local folks, nothing has really changed. Um, and when the management plan is drafted, it really won't affect any of the local boats or any of the local fishermen. 
Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to get those um, interpretation and outreach benefits that we had hoped for uh, with the sanctuary program. Um, that is, unless um, President Obama decides to begin a sanctuary process here before he leaves office. And this is actually something that um, Delegate Khalili and Governor Torres have written to the president to ask him to begin a sanctuary process. Um, and uh, I helped write a nomination um, to begin a sanctuary process, and we submitted it last week. And yes, uh, that I saw that on Facebook, on Facebook that there yeah. were a number of representatives from here mm -hmm. in the Northern Marianas in Washington. So that was the purpose of the visit. Yeah, the purpose of the visit last week was to talk to the federal officials about, you know, there's a lot of disappointment with the pace of the monument out here. Um, we've been told that a management plan is coming. Sort of, they, they, they say it'll be next year, and they've been telling us that for the last four years. Um, and it hasn't materialized yet. Uh, so I, we, the, the Friends of the Monument, you know, we still would like to see the benefits that we originally spoke about from eight years ago come here. Um, and th the way to make that happen is to bring the sanctuary program into, and fold it into the, mo the management of the monument. Did I hear correctly that the sanctuary program is something you would hope would make the the trench a um, UNESCO World Heritage site? So that's a completely separate issue. Um, okay. So, um, so no, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did send an email around to some folks. So um, UNESCO is this organization at the United Nations. And what they do is they recognize the best cultural and natural places around the world. So it's things like the Eiffel Tower, uh, the Great Wall of China. Uh, but also natural areas. So the Rock Islands in Palau were declared a, a, a um, World Heritage Site a couple of years ago. Um, and it's not really, th there's no protection that comes with it. There are no dollars that come along with it. But it's sort of like putting a big golden star next to something and saying, this is a place it that is... It attracts visitors. It attracts visitors, yeah. But um, this, is, this is a globally significant place. Um, and you know, absolutely, I, I think our ocean resources are worthy of, of global recognition. And... Uh, this is something that our local government has worked with the federal government on. Um, Richard Semen uh, worked with some of the federal officials to, to draft a nomination. I think Jen Cabrera uh, had some input into it. I had some input into it. And it was submitted uh, back in February. And um, right now there's a, the, the, the feds are finalizing their nominations. And I think before Obama leaves office, they're going to put forward their nominations. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So we've got... Um, we, we could begin the sanctuary process in the next month. Um, we could uh, begin a World Heritage Site uh, nomination in the next month. Uh, the management plan for the existing monument could be published next year. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a lo lots of good stuff surrounding the trench. Um, you know, we're also seeing a resurgence of traditional sailing, um, which I think is connected to our pr the protection of our natural resources. Um, and I, I don't want to give away any of the secrets, but the, f the federal offices that are currently involved in the management have started hiring people to work on the monument um, related to the issues related to their mission. So it, it's taken eight years, and I know there's been a lot of frustration with the pace of things, but this ball is starting to get rolling. Um, and you can definitely see this in the amount of outreach and research and um, that has been taking place in the last couple of months, last couple of years. Uh, actually, right now, the, the Okeanos, not the Okeanos Foundation, the Schmidt Ocean Foundation is out on their boat, the Falcor in the Marianas Trench, and they are looking at deep sea vents, and um, they're, they're broadcasting it live to around the world. And uh, earlier this year, the Okeanos, which is a NOAA research vessel, was out here. Um, and we all know that James Cameron went to the trench, and there's been a Japanese and Chinese vessels that have come down here. And I think a lot of this, it, it didn't just happen on its own. It was related to the recognition of the Marianas Trench um, starting about 10 years ago. And uh, the discussion that we've been having locally has sparked worldwide interest in this part of the world. Um, and it's probably a good time for me to pass the microphone over to the couple of scientists who are on island this week um, to talk about what they're doing um, and how their programs could actually benefit some of the folks here. Well, as you mentioned, there are a number of avenues ahead of us that we could possibly take, but the one thing that's firm is what they're finding down there and how exciting it is. And uh, We'll be back to talk with those gentlemen after this break. Angelo, thank you for your time. Thanks, Catherine. Bye.
Kafa Day, this is Eulalia Villagomez of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Thank you and see Mossy. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. In this half of the show, we're speaking with two gentlemen who have had the privilege of really working in depth um, at the Marianas Trench, and that is Dr. Andrew David Thaler and Rick McPherson. They're here in the NMI and Guam to talk about the latest science and discoveries that are underway in the waters within and surrounding the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument. Gentlemen, welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I should note that this is our first time in Saipan, actually. I've done deep sea research around the world, um, primarily in Papua New Guinea and in the Cayman Trough, which is another trench in the Caribbean that's about 7,000 meters deep. So it's deep, but it's not nearly as deep as the Mariana Trench. Uh, but this is my first time out in the area, and I'm very excited to be here. And likewise, this is my first time on Saipan. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've worked in Guam. I've worked in a lot of your neighboring island uh, neighbors, but uh, it's really exciting to be here um, on this island that uh, is home to so many spectacular forms of life as well as the deepest place on our planet. So tell us a little bit about the work that you've actually done at the sanctuary or the monument. Um, basically, uh, we are scientists that look at uh, different ends of the ocean spectrum, if you want, um, different extremes. So my end that I look at is at the surface or more near the surface. Uh, I'm a coral reef ecologist, and my work has been focusing on the life that goes down to about 300 feet. Uh, That's not very deep. It's it's not <laughs> it's deeper than most people will will go on a snorkel, but uh, it's still within the light zone or what we call the photic zone. Uh, it's home to coral reefs, which are. Uh, depending upon which studies you're looking at, uh, up to 25% of all life on the planet is found on coral reefs. So they're, they're, really? they're super packed, super dense wow. with diversity. Uh, but my work has uh, focused more on uh, what's unique about coral reefs, what, uh, what we can do to ensure that coral reefs are protected into the future because so much d is dependent upon healthy coral reefs. Um, the economy of many islands is dependent upon healthy beaches and healthy coral reef for fishing or for food security or for tourism. Um, uh, so I recognize that and I'm looking at ways that different islands can take steps to ensure that coral reefs survive well into the future. And so I start at that 300 foot limit and I keep going down as deep as you can go, which right now the deepest vehicle we have can go down to about 6,000 meters. Um, and I'm really interested in how we can uh, understand what impacts people are having on the deep sea floor, which is completely out of sight, out of mind. It's one of the hardest ecosystems to get to, on, it's the hardest ecosystem to get to on the planet. Um, and really see how, because human impacts are already affecting the deep sea. Every time we go down uh, in a submersible or with an underwater robot, we find trash. We'll really? find trash at 6,000 meters. We'll try and trash at 3,000 meters. What kind of trash? Uh, garbage that comes off boats. You find a lot of cans. You find a lot of bottles. You find trash bags. 6,000 meters. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, we had, at one point, we found, uh, I guess, a, a carp, like a rolled up carpet had fallen off the back of a boat. And we recovered, like, a, a huge carpet that had basically turned into a community for a lot of limpets that were living inside of it. It was a really cool thing to see. Uh, and we could kind of get an idea for how long it had been there based on what we knew about shipping channels in the area. But um, these are places that no human has ever seen before, and our trash is already getting there first. Um, you wouldn't have thought that. I wouldn't have thought that. I would have been like, oh, the trench is so deep, it's, you know, pristine. And there's, so there's the Schmidt uh, Research Institute is out right now um, doing some work in the volcanic unit of the monument. monument and they're already sending back some some video of they found cans, they found bottles, they found garbage bags out there. Um, and really, every every dive I've done on in the deep sea, we found some form of human artifact on the seafloor. 
Uh, around here, you find artifacts from World War II still. So there's a lot of old planes that are out there. There's a lot of old munitions, um, a lot of war equipment that's been dumped at the end of the war, uh, some sunken vessels. I know there's a group out in Hawaii right now that they're, they just started diving on some old Japanese mini subs that had been sunk in a stunk that, sorry, that had been sunk in a couple thousand meters of water. So there really are a lot of human impacts in the deep sea, and it's a very hard place to get to. Uh, the Marianas Trench in particular, right now we can't get to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. There has, in the last hundred years, we've built four vehicles that have been able to get down there. Um, the Trieste, which was a bathyscaphe, it's basically an underwater hot air balloon. Um, and that went down in the 1960s. Uh, the Japanese had a robot called the Kaiko that dove the Marianas Trench. More recently, um, the U.S. built the Narius, which was an ROV. Uh, that, an ROV is a remotely operated vehicle, an underwater robot. And that dove the Marianas Trench in 2012. And then, of course, James Cameron went down in his submarine. Uh, all those vehicles are currently either lost or out of commission. So right now, we have more vehicles that have left our solar system than we have that are capable of dying to the Mar diving to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And for me, that means that there is a huge amount of this planet left to explore. The Marianas Trench is huge, and a lot of it is below 6,000 meters that we can't even get to now. It may take us another generation before we can even begin to understand what's happening at the bottom of the trench. What is it you have encountered in your, in your studies that kind of excites you or, or you feel would be <laughs> exciting for people? Um, you know, it's, I can't speak for Andrew, but I, th I suspect that we both share this about our, our viewpoint of science is that it is a field and it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a human enterprise that guarantees you that if you have questions, you will have a lifetime of study. I'm, I'm going up on a 30 year career. I've yet to find a day that I, I don't feel so lucky that I'm working in a field that can provide a lifetime of questions and research and exploration. Um, I want to stress that I think with with whether you're studying the ocean here in the uh, in CNMI or whether you're studying it back in mainland United States, uh, the 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 fact that there are still so many questions that we have yet to ask and answers that we have yet to find out about the ocean, uh, as Andrew um, intimates, we 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 seem to know more about. Uh, about uh, reality beyond planet Earth than we do about what's here, uh, particularly in our oceans. Um, for example, you know, there's so much recent science that's been taking place on islands like this that are looking at the connections between healthy coral reefs and the presence or absence of keystone species such as sharks. The health of coral reefs is dependent upon whether we leave sharks on our reef. Um, the reality that we're getting is that sharks are key to the maintenance of healthy coral reefs. And without sharks, we see more disease on reefs. We see more seaweed smothering reefs. And again, I, I mentioned that healthy coral reefs are the backbone of a lot of island economies, whether it's through food security or whether it's towards tourism. So for me, it's that, it's that the fact that there's still so much to learn and we have, a, we have an obligation to ensure that we don't lose these systems before we understand what we've, what we've potentially got to lose. Yeah, so I would totally agree with that. I feel like that is one of the most important things that come out. One of the things that really inspires me when I'm working in the ocean is um, understanding how resilient it really is. Um, and when you look at some of the places that really are altered by human activities, that we really, we go in and we do quite a lot of environmental insult to, if you leave them alone, if you give them a generation or two generations uh, where they're not exposed to continuous uh, human impact, they recover, and they recover in incredibly profound ways. The example I always like to give is Bikini Atoll, which by any reasonable argument is probably the most altered place on the planet. We detonated some of the biggest hydrogen bombs ever built over it, and because it was radioactive for a while, and because people were excluded from the area for a while, the coral reefs around Bikini Atoll are some of the healthiest reefs in the world by a lot of metrics. Uh, so the ocean is really, it's resilient, it can be a buffer against a lot of impacts on the planet, and as long as, if we can give it a break, if we can kind of leave parts of it alone to continue as it should continue and to, to heal and to grow, you can really get a very, very strong, very healthy ocean ecosystem, uh, even, in the f even in the wake of some massive environmental insults. 
Um, one of the really interesting things that has kind of come into my uh, understanding over the last few years is, you know, a lot of the work I do is working with underwater robots. Uh, we do a little bit of work with submarines, but robots are really the workhorses in the deep sea. Uh, because if you take all the life support systems out of your submersible and just send down an autonomous unit without a person in it, you can put a lot more scientific payload in it and get a lot more data out of it. It can stay down longer. Uh, and so I started, I'm a biologist by training, but I also have been working with robotics companies to get not just the big ROVs that we use for deep sea research, but also smaller ROVs that can be used in shallow water, that people can use for education and outreach into the hands of teachers and educators and citizen scientists and researchers around the world so they can really expose even more people to the incredible biodiversity happening in even their local waterways, uh, not even some of the more ma magnificent reefs around the world, but the Chesapeake Bay where I live is a muddy estuary there's amazing things that happen in it and if you can send a robot down and bring back video so that people can see what's going on at the bottom that can be really important and a really powerful tool for showing people what's going on in the oceans so one of the things i've brought with me on this trip is a little robot called open rov uh, rov stands for remotely operated vehicle it's called open rov because it's open source so the software and the hardware is all uh, freely available for anyone to download if they wanted to build it themselves and most people do build it themselves we actually distribute them as kits and uh, a lot of times what i'll do is i'll have high school students come in um, and build these kits. And these are, these are not toys or like little educational tools, but they're actually serious research submersibles. I've published several papers using data from these robots, and there's actually a team out in Mexico that just had two new marine protected areas assigned based on surveys they had done with these robots. But they're also really powerful for STEM education. So if students are interested in engineering and electronics and software programming, they can come in. They build these robots in a classroom. They get a lot of hands-on experience uh, with all of these really important skills for the 21st century. And they come out of it not only as uh, someone who's capable of operating a little underwater robot, but also someone who's capable of maintaining and building it and keeping it running. Um, and so it's, it's been a very powerful and rewarding uh, experience for me to, to run these workshops and to teach all these kids around the world how to, how to build robots and to show them that they could... Like, robotics is a huge and growing industry and showing kids that they can be they can learn how to become robotics engineers and they can become part of this huge industry and there's huge potentials for careers for them, not just in ocean work, but also in the electronics and robotics end of things as well. The ROV you have with you, how, how deep can it go and what is its value? Uh, the ROV can go down to 100 meters. It costs about $900 and that's unassembled, so there's a couple hundred dollars in materials that go into it depending on how good you are at sourcing them. Um, and it has an HD camera on it. It also has uh, a payload bay, so you can incorporate a bunch of different sensors into it. You can take salinity measurements, chlorophyll measurements, uh, redox, uh, anything you'd want to know about the water column, you can kind of build into it. You're, there's a set of water samplers you can add to it, so you can take discrete water samples depth. So say you were doing a survey of perhaps uh, sewage outflow pipes in you know, near perhaps a resort. Uh, you may not want to send a diver into water near a sewage outfall pipe. I certainly don't want to go into water near a sewage outfall pipe, but robots don't care. So if you wanted to know what was coming out of that pipe, you could send the robot down, take a discrete water sample, bring it back to the surface, clean it before you start handling everything, <laughs> and then get your samples out and be able to do surveys that way without putting people in risk at risk. Well, share with us a little bit, each of you, about your career path, how you first became interested in this line of work and, and the progression. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, I, I consider myself one of those unusual individuals that knew from very early age exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't really know it was called marine biology. I didn't really know what kind of careers were possible, but I certainly loved the ocean. I was fascinated as a child by Jacques Cousteau and Flipper and any of the programs <laughs> that, uh, that, that uh, spurred on my interest. And I was, uh, I was not particularly the most uh, uh, gifted student, uh, particularly in some a of those. A lot of people are going to be able to that. <laughs> Thank you for being open. I'm going to share honestly, I was not a stellar student, but I had an obsessive personality about wanting to strive for something that 
interested me and the idea of having a lifetime of exploration and fascination with something that I loved from being a child I thought outweighed the perhaps uh, the, the challenges the extra work that I had to do in order to to excel and in order to achieve what I wanted to do um, but it my my own career path took many twists and turns I began uh, in a in science doing science both in the lab as well as in the field um, looking at coral reefs around the world and that led to my interest in wanting to share what I was seeing and what I was learning to people that weren't as fortunate to be able to get to see a coral reef. Uh, here in the NMI we're really fortunate that we live surrounded by coral reefs but I grew up in Pennsylvania in, in the foothills <laughs> of the Poconos and uh, I didn't see a coral reef until I was about uh, 19 years old so uh, it took a while but uh, from science to sh sh education uh, I began working as an uh, informal educator, as a formal educator. That led me to also see that uh, coral reefs were threatened globally by a m variety of threats from overfishing to coastal development to water pollution to climate change. And I began wanting to work more towards protecting these ecosystems that were so important to me and I loved since I was a child, so I began working more in conservation. That's been my career arc. It certainly wasn't a straight line, um, but it's been a uh, it's been a fulfilling uh, voyage that I've been uh, that I've been on. So I uh, after high school, I was fortunate enough to get a position at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, uh, working in a seahorse breeding program. And I was uh, lucky enough; I had a very good mentor there, Jorge Gomez Gerardo, who really kind of nurtured my love of science and my uh, love of this kind of maker style approach to things where you don't necessarily use the most sophisticated most advanced tools of the trade but you figure out the ways to get the job done with the cheapest tools available um, and so from there I pursued a de degree in marine biology and then a PhD in marine science and conservation where I was working in uh, Papua New Guinea at hydrothermal vents that are uh, potentially threatened by deep sea mining uh, so Deep sea mining is an emerging industry. No one's actually mined the seafloor yet. Uh, the deep sea floor, people mine things like diamonds off the coast of Namibia, but not in thousands and thousands of meters. But it's an industry that may emerge eventually. And so because I was working at these vent ecosystems that weren't just scientific curiosities, but also something facing imminent threat from human activity, it really uh, inspired me to to think more about the conservation of these systems, not just the scientific merit, but about how we can protect them, how we can preserve them for future generations, how we can make sure that people know that these ecosystems, which are some of the most biodiverse on the planet and clearly the hardest to get to, and some of the, frankly, weirdest on the planet. So <laughs> most life on Earth is dependent on sunlight in some way. Either you're a plant or a bacteria that photosynthesizes, or you're an animal or a fungus or a bacteria that eats a plant that photosynthesizes. But hydrothermal vents, they don't need the sun. They, the organisms that live down there, consume the chemical energy that comes out of the vent, and that's how they get all of their nutrition. And some of these animals don't even have digestive systems. They just have completely separate special organs that uh, house bacteria that pull chemical energy out of the vent systems. And it's really weird. We didn't even know these things existed until the 1970s. And when we discovered them, it totally changed our view of what life on Earth could be. Um, and now, most people in the world have never heard of them, have never seen them, and we're already talking about mining them. So that sort of got me thinking, how do we get more people to understand what's going on in the deep sea? How do we, how do we reach people? How do we bring deep sea science to the surface and that's a lot of where my work with the robotics has come in getting people using the robot as a tool to get people thinking about how to interact with oceans that you can never visit um, so the robots i have with me they can't dive into the deep sea but they can help you they're they're a microcosm of what the robots we use to go into the deep sea are and so instead of using a four million dollar robot to go down six thousand meters you can use a nine hundred dollar robot to go down a hundred meters and understand how that kind of science gets done and get a better context for what the work in, that is happening in the deep sea can be. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us today. Any final thoughts before we go? Uh, thank you for having us. It's really been a pleasure to, uh, to have this conversation. And uh, final thoughts from me are just 
uh, I hope listeners realize how very lucky you are to live here. Uh, I think it's easy to perhaps think that you're somewhere removed from where all of the news and all of the happenings are taking place, and this may just be a sleepy, quiet island, but uh, from our perspective and from our eyes, this is a hotbed of activity, and uh, I hope that the people of the NMI feel very proud to live in a, in a place that has so many superlatives around it, whether it's the spectacular, spectacular life here, the spectacular geology here, the extremes that are found here. Um, it's just been a real honor to finally make it here to, uh, to Saipan. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is only our second day on Saipan, and I'm already trying to figure out how I can get back here and spend even more time. This place is wonderful. <laughs> You've been bitten wonderful. by the island bug. <laughs> <laughs> um, every time we dive in the deep sea, we discover new species. And sometimes they're new species that have chemical compounds that produce novel medical um, pharmaceutical products. Sometimes they're things like hydrothermal vents, which change our understanding of how life functions on Earth. And sometimes they're just incredibly cool, like the giant deep sea isopod, which is um, a pill bug the size of a cat that crawls across the sea floor. It is a bizarre animal. It is totally weird. It is totally wild. It is totally cool. Um, every time we dive in the deep sea, we discover something new. And Half of the Marianas Trench is currently out of reach of all human technology, so what other wonders are we going to discover as we begin accessing more and more of it? Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Harris. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.